Okay, hi everyone. My name is Cara Fernandez. I work as the program director at the Quag Wildlife Refuge. And we're really excited today to have our presenter, Sarah Ward from the National Wildlife Federation, um, talking to us about how to create and certify a wildlife habitat in your yard or garden. So we're really excited for her presentation today. And um, just a quick update about the, the refuge. We are still open uh, every day from sunrise to sunset. It's it's free to visit and you can come hike on our seven miles of trails. You can visit our nature center. We are open to our normal hours, which is very exciting. So on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're now open from 11 to four. And then of course, in the future, you can always check our website, quagwildliferefuge.org um, to see if you, we have any changes in that schedule. But uh, there's lots of good things to see if you walk here at the refuge. Um, and like we were saying, some signs of spring have been popping up all around us. We've been seeing red-winged blackbirds, osprey, spring peeper um, frogs are calling. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce Sarah. So Sarah Ward is the Community and Schoolyard Habitats Program Manager for National Wildlife Federation in New York City. In this role, she leads place-based ed environmental education and habitats restoration projects throughout New York City and supports community and um, supports community groups and schools in designing, building, and enjoying wildlife habitat gardens. She is also an avid gardener and grows a wide variety of native plants in her Brooklyn backyard that provide habitat to local insects, pollinators, and birds. So thanks for joining us tonight, Sarah. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, hello, everybody. It's so nice to be here. Happy spring. Um, I love hearing about all of your early spring wildlife sightings. It's getting me exciting, excited for this season. Um, yeah, so it's great to be here today. And I am here to talk to you about wildlife habitat gardening. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, we'll talk about um, National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife Program and how you can create a wildlife habitat um, in your garden or your yard, and you can cert, um, that supports birds, butterflies, and bees. And I'll also tell you how you can have your garden recognized as a certified wildlife habitat by National Wildlife Federation. Um, I also, as Kara mentioned, um, I will do my best to get through um, to leave time at the end for some Q and A because um, I hope that I hope that this brings up a lot of questions and. Um, I have a lot of slides to go through, but it's mostly just a lot of great pictures of wildlife. So <laughs> if I have to speed through a few of them, that's fine. Um, Cause I'd love to hear from all of you as well. Before we talk about wildlife habitat gardening, I wanna tell you a little bit about the National Wildlife Federation in case you don't know. Um, NWF was founded in 1936 and it's one of the oldest and largest wildlife conservation organizations in the US. Our mission is to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrives in a rapidly changing world. We do this work in a wide variety of ways. We have offices throughout the US and several and separate state affiliates in each state who band together with us to fight for wildlife. I'm part of the Northeast Regional Center is our regional office and we support um, all of the states in New England, as well as New York and New Jersey. We also work in DC to ensure we have strong legislation to protect wildlife and its habitat. And we publish Ranger Rick magazine and have a long history of inspiring kids to get outside and develop a love for the natural world. We also work to protect the wildlife species that happily coexist with us in our cities, towns, and neighborhoods, and even our backyards. Um, and so, and that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So since 1973, the National Wildlife Federation has been inspiring people to restore habitat and invite wildlife back into our neighborhoods through our wildlife, or through our Garden for Wildlife program. And so really, you know, the question I always ask is how can our gardens help wildlife? So if you're a gardener, you may not um, be thinking about about helping wildlife when you're planting, when you're installing your plants every spring. 
Um, but really, the reason why that um, garden or gardens can support wildlife is because wildlife rely on native plants for survival. Without healthy, diverse plant communities, wildlife can't survive. And it's why we have a gardening program and encourage people to plant for wildlife. So we'll keep coming back to this point over and over, but in nature, plants provide wildlife for habitat. Um, they provide habitat for wildlife. They form the base of the food web. Um, that's true in wilderness areas, but it's also true in our cities, towns, and neighborhoods, and even in our own yards. So if plants are the starting point or the bottom of the food web, insects would be the next level. Insects are very important for wildlife. Um, they're important species in and of themselves, but they, all, they also are food for many other species. Um, so plants support insects. And in fact, the majority of insects rely on plants that they've co-evolved with over many years. Um, these are the native plants of a region. Most, most of you probably know a little bit about native plants by now. And I suspect because I think there's a lot of wildlife lovers here that um, you understand some of the relationships between plants and between native plants and wildlife. Um, but this wasn't always the case. This awareness, um, our awareness of the importance of native plants has grown over the last 20 years. And just in case you don't know, native plants are simply the plant species that evolved in any given region. Native plants are great choices for your garden or landscape. Um, they've evolved in your region and they've adapted to the local climate. They've adapted to the local soils. Um, they, they have adapted to the weather patterns and the rainfall levels. Um, and they don't need a lot of extra care in our gardens. They don't need extra watering or pesticides or fertilizers. Um, but most importantly, native plants are the plants that wildlife rely on for survival. And here's just one example that I'll show you, um, just to think about the relationship between, between native plants and, and some of our wildlife. So native oaks serve as the caterpillar house plant for 557 species of butterflies and moths. And here I'll give a quick plug for Doug Ptolemy, who's an entomologist and an, and an author. He has several great books about the relationship between, between, plant, he's an, um, between plants and, um, and insects in particular. Um, one of the books is called Bringing Nature Home. And so um, he's, he did a lot of this research. So, so I'll go back to this. Native oaks serve, the, serve as the caterpillar host plant for 500 57 species of butterflies and moths. And in contrast, the non-native ginkgo tree supports zero species of butterflies and moths. And so this is true of most non-native plants. They just do not support the, the number of species that are um, that our native plants do. And so this is what it boils down to is that wildlife need plants to survive. Specifically, they need the plants that are native to their region, um, which are the plants that they have co-evolved with. And that's what, the, that's what our Garden for Wildlife program is all about. Um, we encourage people to plant native plants that provide habitat for local wildlife. And the act of planting something for a purpose is the definition of gardening. When you plant vegetables, you're a vegetable gardener. And when you plant native plants to support wildlife, you're a wildlife habitat gardener. And we'll talk about what I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by wildlife in the context of the wildlife habitat garden. So songbirds, butterflies, and hummingbirds are the kinds of wildlife that will be attracted to a garden or a landscape planted with native. This is great. Everyone loves birds and butterflies. I certainly do. <laughs> These are the wildlife that I welcome in my backyard here in the city. But there's a world of wildlife beyond the birds and butterflies that will also benefit from your wildlife habitat garden. 
The world of insects is incredibly diverse beyond just butterflies. Um, remember, insects are wildlife. Um, and amphibians like this tree frog, tree frog are on the decline worldwide, um, but your yard can help support their local populations. Sometimes wildlife that scares us will also show up in the wildlife habitat garden, and that's okay. Um, animals such as snakes are incredibly important wildlife species, and most of them are 100% harmless to people like this garter snake. All snake species will help to keep rodents, insects, and even, even other snakes in check. And wasps, like the, like the wasps that you see in the photo here on the right, they can sting, but they are also pollinators like their bee cousins. And unlike bees, wasps are also predatory. So they will put, patrol the garden and take care of actual plant, of actual pests in your garden. And these are the kinds of wildlife that we should also welcome into our garden. And sometimes, um, sometimes wildlife can be a, be a nuisance, as you may have experience with. You don't have to welcome every creature into your garden. Um, you can focus on birds and butterflies and, and put up fencing or other repellents to, to deter wildlife such as deer. And just remember, in most case, cases of conflict with wildlife like raccoons, we can usually solve that with a few simple behavior changes on our part. So we can store a pet food indoors, we can wait until morning to put the trash out, or we can use trash cans with tight fitting lids to really discourage them from, um, from coming into, into our spaces to find food. And remember that a, a habitat garden isn't just for wildlife, it's for people too, it's for all of us. It can be a, a wonderful place to relax and um, and to get a daily dose of nature that's right outside your door. It doesn't matter how young or old you are, we all benefit from getting outside and enjoying the natural world. Okay. So here we'll talk about um, the things, the components of a wildlife habitat. So what, what does your garden um, need to have to, to be considered a wildlife habitat? And so all wildlife species need four things to survive. They need food, water, cover, and places to raise their young. I'll talk about each of these specifically. And when you provide these four things and, to, and commit to maintaining your garden in an environmentally friendly way, you can certify it as a National Wildlife Federation certified habitat through our Garden for Wildlife program. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. All right, we'll first talk about food for wildlife. The first thing you probably think about when someone says feeding the birds is putting out bird feeders, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but remember that birds only use feeders as supplements to the natural foods that they find in a landscape. And even only a few species of birds will, will use a feeder. So feeders are a snack, they're not habitat. And the best way to feed the birds and other wildlife is by planting native plants. Native plants can provide food in many different ways. They produce berries and fruit. Uh, they can produce cones, seeds, and nuts that are food for wildlife and all sorts of birds and other wildlife rely on these food sources. Plants also produce nectar, which is the primary food source for butterflies and bees. Hummingbirds and moths also rely on nectar from flowers as their primary food source. So here are like all of the, the wildlife are finding all of their food sources from plants. Plants can provide food in other ways too. So sap is a food source for sap suckers, a kind of woodpecker. Pollen is an important food source for bees and other insects. Bees feed their young pollen and without it, they can't survive. Some animals will eat the foliage of your plants and that's okay. Caterpillars feed on the leaves of their host plants. 
And it's usually worth it to sacrifice a few leaves to support wildlife. Uh, our native plants have evolved to this type of feeding activity as well. And so they aren't going to die if something eats some of their leaves. As I already mentioned, so native plants are the foundation of our food web, and then they're followed by insects. And the importance of insects as a food source can't be overstated. Everything eats insects, including other insects, including spiders, including small mammals, frogs, lizards, and birds. Insects are an especially important food source for birds. So 96% of backyard birds rely on insects as a primary food source for themselves and to feed their young. Without bugs, without insects, your garden can't support birds. I'll give you one, one example. So a recent study looked at Carolina chickadees and it found that one pair of chickadee parents had to catch between 6,000 and 9,000 insects just to successfully raise one nest of babies. And they only hunt for those insects within a radius of about 150 feet from the nest. So that's a ton of insects. Um, but if you plant native plants in your, in your yard, you'll support those insects. And in turn, you'll give birds the food source that they need and their young need to survive. This is wildlife conservation on the scale of your yard. And so we've got the plants and then the insects as part of the foundation of our food web. And after the insects, other small animals are the next level of the food chain. Again, this is normal and natural. Predators are important and everything needs to eat. And once you've planted native plants and established a food web, you can supplement with a few feeders. Um, there are many kinds of feeders that you, can, that you can install in your garden or yard. There's seed feeders and nectar feeders and suet feeders. Um, I would just urge you to regularly clean your feeders because dirty feeders can spread disease. This is not what, we, what we're talking about when we say to provide food for wildlife. We're talking about providing natural food sources by planting native plants and creating a food web. Unlike birds, which don't become dependent on feeders, mammals will, and they'll start associating people with food if that's the case. This is unhealthy for them, and it can create dangerous situation, and it typically ends bad for the animal, either because of malnutrition or because animal control must be called. So don't do this, it's not helping wildlife. Squirrels are an exception to that, to that rule, mostly because there's not much that you can do to keep them out of your bird feeders. Uh, I'd say the best way to try to deter squirrels is to get a squirrel-proof feeder. But unfortunately, squirrels are very clever and they have an uncanny ability to outwit us when it comes to getting into our feeders. So we just continue to try to outsmart them. So we've talked about food for wildlife and how native plants are really the primary source of food in our wildlife gardens. And next we'll talk about the second component of habitat, which is water. All wildlife needs water for drinking. And in the case of birds, uh, they need it for bathing to keep their feathers in good condition. Some kinds of wildlife actually live in the water, like this green frog. Water makes up their primary habitat. And some of you may be lucky to have a large pond on your property. This kind of water feature might attract ducks or other waterfowl, wading birds, or, or aquatic turtles. And it's a wonderful component. It makes a wonderful wildlife habitat for them. Um, we just, I'd just be sure to leave a, 
a buffer of natural vegetation as habitat around the around the pond, and it will also help to absorb runoff. Um, so you don't so you don't want to mow right down to the water's edge. But more likely, you only have room for a small garden pond like this one, and this is great. Well. Well, this kind of water feature won't support waterfowl or aquatic turtles, but lots of wildlife from birds to frogs to dragonflies will use it. As with larger ponds, make sure to have plenty of aquatic vegetation to provide habitat and to serve as ladders so that animals can get in and out of the water. If you don't have room for a pond, that's okay. And a simple bird bath will meet this habitat requirement. Any shallow dish will work. Um, water depth for a bird bath should be between one and three inches. And you never know what kind of birds will visit your bird bath. Uh, these are barred owls. And I should also note that working at National Wildlife Federation, um, I'm very lucky to have so many wonderful photos that, um, that our members and supporters have contributed as part of um, our Garden for Wildlife photo contest. So these are not my photos, but um, they're wonderful photos from people all over the US who have, who have donated them to us so that we can use them in presentations like this. And as a nice reminder, um, it's great to remember that insects need water too. Um, I love adding these in small gardens, um, especially in a pollinator garden. You can create a simple water source for insects by just taking a plant dish and adding some stones or pebbles or marbles and filling it with water. And these stones will serve as landing pads so that insects don't fall in and drown. Even mud puddles will count as a water source for your, for your wildlife habitat. Birds are happy to drink and bathe in puddles and butterflies engage in a behavior called puddling where they drink the mineral rich water from the muddy soil. So these are all sources of wildlife, um, all sources of habitat that you can add to your garden at home. And I know that mosquitoes can be a concern when we're adding um, water elements into our yards or gardens, but controlling mosquitoes can be easy. It's important to remember that mosquitoes take five to seven days to go through their aquatic larval phase. So just dump out your bird baths every couple of days and refresh them with clean water. And when you do that, you'll also dump out any mosquito eggs or larva too. For ponds, you can inoculate the water with a natural bacteria that targets mosquitoes, but it's harm, harmless to other wildlife and people. Um, you can usually find this sold as mosquito dunks, or sometimes they're called mosquito granules, and they can typically be purchased at your garden center or a local hardware store, or even online. Right, <laughs> and then, yeah. Another very cute photo um, because you'll never know who'll show up at your bird bath. All right, we've talked about food and water, and now we'll get to the third component of a habitat garden, which is cover. Wildlife need places to hide from predators, or if they are predators, they need places to hide from prey so that they can get a meal unnoticed. As these photos show, plants are the main way that wildlife will find cover. The same plants that provide food can, can do double duty and offer cover for wildlife too. Wildlife also, ne also needs cover from elements so animals will look for shelter during times of extreme heat or cold or during rain or snowstorms or when it's very windy outside. And again, plants are where they go to find this cover. Evergreens provide cover year round and are particularly important in winter months when our deciduous trees and shrubs are leafless. 
And plants with thorns offer a bit of added protection for small wildlife like the sparrow. And in your garden, providing cover with plants is largely about how you plant your garden or yard. So if you plant densely like this photo, you'll, you'll provide plenty of cover. Planting densely doesn't mean that your yard needs to look messy or too wild. If you plant in large, if you plant large patches of native species and practice good garden design, your habitat garden can be beautiful just like this one. Um, in addition to providing cover, so planting densely like this, um, as pollinators or other insects are feeding on flowers, this is a more efficient way for them to find the flowers and also to, to forage. And cover is important because many species just won't ever visit an open yard that's mostly, mostly lawn, like this wood thrush. <clears throat> wood thrushes need the cover of trees and shrubs and forage for food in the branches and in leaf litter. They're rapidly declining in part because we've converted their habitats into lawns. So your wildlife habitat garden could help turn the tide for them. And even in our garden um, and natural areas, dead plants are full of life. So fallen logs and branches provide cover for many animals. Small animals can hide under them, or if they're hollow, they can also hide inside of them. You can, you can build a brush pile by stacking logs and branches into a pile, and it will become like a wildlife hotel of sorts that welcomes all kinds of little critters to it. Um, it might not be for everyone, but these are just some ideas of ways that you can incorporate these elements into your yard or garden. And fallen leaves are another um, important source of cover for wildlife. If you look closely, you might be able to spot the toad in this photo. Uh, so many species live in the leaf litter of our yards and garden. Um, so try not to rake up or blow away every leaf on your property. Instead, you can use it as natural mulch in your garden beds, just like nature intended, and it will provide cover for lots of small animals. Additionally, many butterflies and moths, they also overwinter in fallen leaf litter. So if you're raking up those leaves and like burning them or throwing them out, you're also getting rid of all of those overwintering moth and butterfly species. You can also put out a special, special bird houses called roosting boxes. Um, birds don't, they won't nest in these boxes. Instead, they use them as shelter on cold nights or during bad weather. Uh, the entry to the boxes is at the bottom, unlike a nesting box. And so this will help heat because heat rises and having the hole at the bottom helps trap the body heat of the birds inside and keeps them warm. All right, so we've talked about food, we've talked about water, we've talked about cover, um, about including these components and resources into your yard or garden. Now we'll talk about the places for wildlife to raise their young. And this one's really important. It's great to feed a bird or provide places for small animals to find cover or drink. But unless species have the space and the resources to find a mate, to build a nest, to lay eggs or dig a burrow or give birth and successfully raise their young to adulthood, species will decline. So your habitat garden can ensure the future for wildlife. And again, just as I've said many times, plants are the main way that you'll provide places for wildlife to raise their young. Most birds nest within trees and shrubs. Some build their nests in branches, while others nest inside cavities within the trunks of trees. Um, and some, like great horned owls, they don't build nests, but they'll, they'll use a nook between the branches and the trunk of trees. Plants can provide natural hiding places where mothers leave their young. 
Deer fawns and baby rabbits spend most of the day hiding in vegetation while their mothers feed nearby. Even species that don't directly care for their young, like turtles, they need vegetation to hide in as, as babies so they can avoid predators. And some cavity nesting birds will use a nesting box, which mimic the natural tree cavities they normally nest in. Wrens, chickadees, bluebirds, swallows, woodpeckers, and even some species of warblers, ducks, and owls, like this screech owl here on the right, will use a nesting box. Nesting boxes have actually helped bluebird populations recover after their populations crashed in the first half of the 20th century. As suburban areas spread and took over woodlands and old farm fields, the dead trees and the old fence posts that bluebirds used as nesting spots were eliminated, and so the, bird, the bluebird populations declined. But in part because of the efforts to replace those nesting places with nesting boxes, bluebird populations have begun to recover. It's not just birds that need nesting places. Bees also need places to nest. Um, there are over 4,000 species of native bees in North America. This doesn't include the non-native honeybee, which is really a domestic species that was brought here for pollination services and to produce honey. Unlike honeybees, most of our native bees, they don't form hives. They're solitary nesters, and so they require nesting tunnels in the ground, like this ground nesting bee here in the photo, or they nest in tunnels in decayed wood or inside plant stems. So if you leave some bare ground in your garden for ground nesting bees and, rot and rotting logs for plant nesting bees, they'll find some places to, to create their nests. You can also put out special bee nesting houses like this one. Uh, they offer, this one offers individual tubes for female bees to lay their eggs. So each female bee will fill a tunnel with a series of chambers. And in each chamber, she lays an egg provisioned with a ball of nectar and pollen that the bee larva will feed on. Um, the larva will pupate within the tunnel and overwinter there and it will emerge as an adult the following year to repeat the process. Similar to um, bird feeders, it's important to, to clean these out and to, to refresh some of the, the tubes each season because they can also um, harbor diseases and spread within, within the little bee house. This is always a fun one to include in your in your garden or your yard. Um, and just remember that many native bees need mud to build chamber walls in their nesting tunnels. And birds also like robins and, phoe and phoebes will use mud to build their nests. So a bowl of mud can be a really important resource for, that allows wildlife to raise their young. Also, um, some species need completely different resources during different parts of their life cycle, especially during the ju their juvenile phases. So the caterpillars of butterflies and moths, um, as you probably know, feed on the leaves of plant instead of flower nectar like the adults. Um, they can only eat leaves of certain plants, which are called their host plants. Without these host plants, these insects can't reproduce successfully. Similarly, frogs, toads, and many salamanders will start out life as aquatic larvae um, that breathe through gills. So they need a clean body of standing water to successfully complete their life cycle. And just for a minute, I wanna focus on one particular butterfly species, the monarch butterfly. As many of you may know, um, 
monarch caterpillars, they only feed on milkweed plants and it's the species only caterpillar host plants. So um, without it, they cannot reproduce if they don't have the, the milkweed plants to feed on. Monarchs are large, they're beautiful. They're easily recognizable butterflies. Um, if most people think of a butterfly, they, the monarch butterfly is probably one that come, the, one, the first one that comes to mind. Um, but unlike most insects, monarch butterflies are migratory. The population east of the Rockies, they all migrate to a few spots in Mexico for the winter. In spring, they'll repopulate the continent over the course of four or five generations, relying on milkweed to lay their eggs. West of the Rockies, the population migrates to coastal California. And unfortunately, both populations have plummeted, largely due to loss of habitat, and in particular, due to loss of their, the, the caterpillar host plant milkweed. But the good news is, is that, there, um, is that we can plant milkweed in our gardens. Um, we can also plant nectar plants for the, for the, um, for the adult butterflies as, as well. Um, and there are several dozen species of milkweed native to the US and many of them are just absolutely gorgeous garden plants. These are just a few of the, of the ones that are generally easy to find in our region here. So um, on the top left, we have a butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa, and below that is the common milkweed. And um, the photo on the right shows the shows swamp milkweed. And there's a few other species that are native um, to our region, but in general, these are the, the ones that are easy to find and that do, that do quite well in our gardens. Um, the, the common milkweed might, can be a little bit aggressive in small garden spaces, um, but there's, there's different ways you can contain it. <laughs> and then there's also, but if you have a large space where it can really stretch out, um, it would probably be happy there as well. And so by planting milkweed, we can provide places for monarchs to raise their young and we can um, help do our part to help their populations recover. Okay, so that covers the four components of habitat. We've got food, water, cover, and places for wildlife to raise their young. And once you provide those in your yard or garden, um, it's also to maintain it in an environmentally friendly way. So this means don't use pesticides, don't, pray, don't spray toxic chemicals or use fertilizers um, in your garden. Pesticides will kill, also kill the plants and insects that birds rely on for food. So practice organic gardening techniques. And when you create, um, when you welcome wildlife in the garden, you're creating this very biodiverse environment and this will help support natural pest control. Um, so you're supporting the natural predators and um, that will help kind of keep some of your garden pests in check as well. You can practice water conservation strategies. So this might mean reducing the amount of lawn um, that you have. It means planting natives because as we know that native, native plants are adapted to the, to the local climate and they require less water and maintenance once they're established. You can harvest rainwater off of, um, off of roof, the roof of your house or other structures in your garden. Um, or you could create rain gardens that'll capture some of the storm water. And so really this, this is the standard landscape for a lot of America and it supports, it supports nothing. It's essentially a dead zone. Um, and so this is what wildlife is up against. So it's up to us to make the choice to plant with a purpose and create wildlife habitat gardens and, and, and landscapes that actually fit into the local ecosystem and support wildlife. 
You don't have to rip out your entire yard or let your property grow, grow completely wild. Um, small change is still important and it really does make a difference for our local wildlife populations. So we could go from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. This is beautiful, it's natural, it's not overly wild or too messy. There's still some lawn um, for the kids to play on or for other activities, but this yard, this yard supports dozens of species of birds, of butterflies and other wildlife. So if each, if each of us added one new garden bed filled with native plants each year, the impact on wildlife would be huge. We can start small and go from there. Planting a wildlife habitat garden is the perfect way to think globally and act locally. And you can create a wildlife habitat garden anywhere. It does not have to be a yard or at your house. Um, you can create one in containers. You can, you can build, create wildlife habitat on city rooftops and small spaces like a balcony. Um, at your local school, you can build a schoolyard habitat, um, libraries, places of worship. If you can plant something, then you can provide habitat for wildlife. And so, anyway, did I? And once you've, once you've added all of these components to your, to your yard or garden, you can certify it as an official National Wildlife, um, National Wildlife Federation habitat. So when you do this, when you certify, you become a National Wildlife Federation member. You'll also get a free one-year subscription to National Wildlife Magazine. You'll get a lifetime subscription to Garden for Wildlife e-newsletter, a certificate, and you'll also get a 10% discount on the National Wildlife Catalog. And that offers a lot of great feeders and bird baths and nesting boxes that you can add to enhance your habitat. You can also purchase signs so that you can help spread the word um, about wildlife gardening. Um, there's a $20 application fee and the sign fees will go to support our conservation programs at National Wildlife Federation. And so this is where, oh, these are some of the signs that you can add as well as the certificate. And this is where you can go to certify your garden. It will walk you through a checklist so that you can check off what types of food, what types of cover, what types of water, water that you're providing in your yard or garden. And then once you complete that and submit it, you can, um, you can make it official. And I know we didn't really, um, didn't have a lot of time to go into like specifics about different types of plants, um, different species of plants that you can, that you can install in your garden. But this is another tool that we have on our website that's a great resource that can help you. So this is called the Native Plant Finder, and we developed it in collaboration with Doug Ptolemy, who I mentioned earlier. And you can, you can plug in your zip code and it will, it will send you back a list of the native plants that provide the most value to wildlife in your specific zip code. So you can find native plants and the a reverse search will you can find butterflies and you can um, you can save all of the plants that show up on your on your list. It will walk you through trees, shrubs, as well as um, flowering perennials and grasses. And also new to us in the last couple of years through our Garden for a Wildlife program is that we've started selling native plants. And so these are plants that are adapted to our region. They're grown by nurseries who don't use any chemicals or pesticides, and they're grown in regional nurseries. And so they're really, um, I know here in New York City, it can often be difficult to find native plants, especially for home gardens, larger scale um, plants, it's uh, restoration projects, it's, it's a little bit easier to find. Um, and so just a small, small, small scale garden, this is a great way to get plants delivered right to your door. They come in different packs for, the, for a shade garden, for a sun garden. Um, you can get um, a pack that will support 
pollinators, one that will support monarchs in particular, others that will support um, hummingbirds as well. So it's really easy, uh, really, really great way to get plants delivered right to your door. So I know that was a lot of slides to get through, so thank you. Um, and so we are at the point where I'm happy to answer questions or just to hear about some of your experiences. I always, I love talking to wildlife lovers. I love talking to gardeners. So if you have any questions about anything that was here, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. That was amazing. And I loved the pictures of the barred owl. Hi. And that in the uh, sorry in the water fountain that was so cute but I did um, allow participants to unmute themselves but maybe before we do that there are some questions in the chat that I can read out loud um, so maybe we'll start with one question that came in at the point where you were talking about um, introducing I think it wasn't was it an algae or a plant into a pond in your backyard to reduce mosquito larva and the question was, do, does that damage the larva of dragonflies? Okay, yeah. So the as far as I know, and what they're advertised, it's this bacteria that will just target the mosquito larva. So it doesn't harm, doesn't harm people and doesn't harm other wildlife species. So it's targeted just for those mosquitoes. Awesome. And then um, a question from Mindy was where to get a nesting box. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I can do another plug for our, um, our catalog, which our National Wildlife Catalog, which is really just a, a different site, um, part of our part of National Wildlife Federation. And so they do sell some nesting boxes, and some um, other uh, bird feeders and roosting boxes and things like that there. Um, I think the other, I mean, maybe the Wildlife Refuge has some other like local resources too, because you do want to make sure that it's constructed out of the right, the right lumber and the right materials and then it's the right dimensions. And the other important thing is just like, depending on which species that you're trying to attract to the garden, um, you're, you're installing it at the right height or in a suitable location. So there are a few different things that you should consider, but that should also be part of the instructions if you're getting it from, from somebody that's creating them um, specifically for wildlife. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And I have seen really good, if you have the ability or the time to create your own, um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology has really great plans that for nest boxes that are specific to the species, which are really cool. And then I've seen them for sale, like in our area at Agway, um, in different garden centers. I think those are good places to look for if you do your research prior to knowing what species you'd like to attract. Um, so yeah, great point on that. And then I did see a question about um, buying bee nesting tubes. And I have seen them for sale online. And Michelle mentioned in the chat that she's seen them for sale on Amazon. But did you have any more insight to that, Sarah, for bee nesting tubes? You can make your own as well, right? I've seen. you. Can, yeah, you can make your own out of like I mean, basically like a biodegradable straw or something that, um, so not using plastic or anything like that in the garden. And so they are also sold at places that would, yeah, where you would probably, again, we sell them in our catalog. Um, you can find them there, but another place to look for them is, um, if you know of the Xerces Society, is there a um, they're an insect conservation organization, and they may have a um, they typically will have a list of resources of of places where you can get high quality um, nesting ne of like bee houses and things like that for your garden too. Yeah, and I was reading recently about. Um, that sometimes if you see bee houses for sale in major stores and, or suppliers that they might not be the best actually they might just like look attractive but not be that um, efficient for the bees that nest in tubes um, so it is important to to research um, it then, is and and just kind of think about 
you know, where would these bees be nesting if they didn't have this house or <laughs> this box that we're providing them? And so the most important thing you can do in your garden is to just have to have that bare soil so they could make nests in the, in the so soil or the ground um, to also like leave your, leave your plant stems through winter, you know, so don't do a fall cleanup in your garden, leave everything. Those seed heads provide um, sources of food for wildlife during the winter. And then if you need to cut things back in the spring, leave those stems about 12 to 24 inches and the bees can also nest in the, in the hollow parts of the stems as well. So um, natural, the natural areas to nest are more important than, than some of the other um, things that we can buy. I have to say that I think things like butterfly houses, I think they're really, they're really cute and they're in structures to add to our gardens. I've never seen a butterfly <laughs> use one, but, but they also, I mean, so it kind of, they're conversation starters and they're also just focal points in the garden as well. Um, so those are, might be some other reasons you want to add things like that to the garden. Awesome. Yeah. And um, Sarah asked, what are some of the highest impact strategies that you've seen for urban gardeners? Um, okay, so can you repeat that one again? Sorry, I was kind of looking yes, so, in the job. Uh, but I know. Um, what are some of the highest impact strategies that you've seen in urban gardens? Yeah, so, I mean, so we can't, some of the things that I showed you are not all possible in urban gardens. So it can be really, you know, there's often not a, a lot of space for uh, for ponds, for example. Um, but I think, I would say for urban gardens, I think the idea of just planting densely and then really being selective about the species um, that are in your garden. So making sure, and, we focus a lot on pollinator conservation in the city. So I often think just planting for, for pollinators is, is a great strategy. And so when you're planting for pollinators, you're also attracting the birds and some of the other urban wildlife that we have here. So that would mean, um, that would mean planting, planting densely and to have a um, a variety of plants that will be blooming throughout from spring to fall so that pollinators will be able to find nectar from flowers um, from spring to fall. And so that would mean just having species um, that flower in all of those seasons. And, and also say that, um, yeah, for urban, I mean, just you'll be, I mean, it's so, it's so rewarding and you'll be surprised at, at who shows up in your garden. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of insects that live in the city. There are a lot of birds that will, that will come to your backyard that will, uh, resident birds that stay here all winter, but then also migrating species as well. So even planting for them, it's always a treat. Awesome. And um, do you have time, Sarah, for a few more questions I saw? Yeah, of course, okay. of course. Thank you. Um, one question was about having a small pond for frogs to lay their eggs in. And how would you clean the water without disturbing the eggs? Um, one interesting thing that uh, Kath Catherine put in the chat, which I never heard of, was putting a barley ball in the water. But do you have any insight into that, Sarah, about keeping the water clean? Right. Yeah. And admittedly, because I'm like gardening in New York City most of the time, I have less experience with water, with ponds and water gardens. Um, but yeah, you want, you need a, you need a clean body of water for those, um, for those tadpoles. And I think maybe, um, I don't know any aquatic species off the top of my head that would be that could also be important to include in that habitat, um, but I'm I'm looking for that chat because I want to um, bring find that what is it called the barley a barley, barley ball. Um, yeah, because I've never heard of that, and I'm gonna bring this to some some of my colleagues too, and I'm I'm happy to kind of yeah be in after this to to share some of these answers where I'm not um, best expert. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I just like as an anecdote, like here at the refuge, we have freshwater ponds where the frogs will lay their eggs in. And we've been contacted by members of the public too that have seen frogs being laid in like very small puddles. Sometimes they'll, they'll lay their eggs in people's swimming pools that are not being treated with chemicals. So I don't think it would have to be super clean. Um, but of course they would have like some organic matter always in a pond, but yeah, it's very interesting. Um, that's, that's great. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, nothing ponds in nature are these like vernal pools. Yeah. They're not always going to be super clean as you noted. <laughs> you want to do best for these, like these creatures, these critters that we're inviting into our, into definitely. Our yeah, absolutely. And it is it's so interesting, you know, to think about how our backyards can connect habitats um, where it was taken away from wildlife and how, you know, even if um, you don't live close to a wildlife refuge or if your backyard isn't forested, how you can really make it a place where wildlife can thrive. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah. Today. And, and that's a great that's a great point to think of um, just in terms of like connected habitats or corridors for wildlife. So if you're doing your part by creating a wildlife garden in your yard or on your property, you know, what can you do? Like, how can we connect all of these habitats together? And so it really can be a little bit contagious. So, you know, if you help spread the word about like why you're planting certain species or, or what types of animals you're trying to attract, it can also encourage other people to do the same. Definitely. Awesome. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but um, if anyone has one that they'd like to ask over audio, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, and I see all the, Sarah, great comments about the butterfly bush. Um, yeah, sadly, it's not, and it's not native and it, <clears throat> it has started to escape our garden. So it's becoming invasive in, in many regions. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add one thing to the bee houses. Uh, I had a bee house and it was those tubes and they were bamboo and I never saw a bee in there. And then I read up about it. Only certain bees will use that type of a house. Yeah, it's, it's true. So yeah, there's so many different bees and they all have kind of different, different nests that they like to build. Um, so mason bees and will we'll nest in tubes like that um, and, and other solitary nesting bees, but, but bumblebees wouldn't make nests and, and, um, and things like that. So yeah, I just figured I'd mention it before people bought them because it, it kind of a, doesn't, it, it, it'll be futile because you won't see anything in them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have seen some in them, um, but yeah, I, I tend to, like I said before, just try to focus on those those natural habitat areas, whether it's soil or dead wood, where they can where they can make their nest too. But yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing. All right. Well, thank you guys all so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate it, you being on with us tonight. And I will send this recording out to everyone who registered. Um, and I think that it's a great way to start the springtime. And I know I'm excited to get in my garden and plant some seeds and plant some native um, plants. So thank you all so much again. And I see a lot of thank yous coming into the chat. So thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you so much and happy gardening and uh, wildlife viewing and all of that um, this spring. So I want to thank Kara and the Wildlife Refuge for having me. Yeah, thank you. All right, everybody have a great night and happy spring.